Podcast and Shopify, and welcome to the demo, uh, to the Twitter demo in which we access the Twitter API. This is going to introduce us to a closed or private API, um, uh, which means we have to jump through a couple more hoops than with uh, an open or public API. Um, but eventually, um, we're going to run code that accesses Twitter in the same way you do on the browser, um, and in the process, get a sense a little bit of what's under the hood of Twitter. Um, what's involved in accessing it um, through the way a computer sees the world rather than through the way we see the world or the internet through our browsers. Uh, we're also going to get um, a sense of all the different ways to access, uh, to find, to search for um, Twitter data, tweet data, uh, social media data in a way that um, uh, is accessible through code. So uh, maybe it's a good time to start with what is Twitter? Uh, this is Twitter. Um, uh, I'm on the page of a person, Jack. Uh, um, they have a profile, you know, uh, and, and, and this profile has components. It has parts uh, that are stored in the computer that we can access with the computer. Uh, a, a screen name, a uh, handle, uh, a uh, profile picture, um, like a, a date of, of joining, a, um, uh, a bio, a number of followers. These are the people who are interested in what this person has to say. Um, a number of following. These are the, the people who um, this person thinks have something interesting to say. Uh, and of course, their tweets, which are these my, tiny posts that they put out to the world. Um, uh, tweets, of course, also have components. Um, uh, we've got uh, the text of a tweet. Tweets can have pictures. They can contain links. They contain hashtags. Uh, they can be retweeted. Um, they can be quoted. They can be liked. They have a date. They came out at a certain time. This is all stuff that uh, is stored in a tweet. Um, uh, these are all properties a tweet has, and, th and these are things we can access. Now, we're accustomed to accessing them through our browser, um, and analogous human to browser is computer to what we're going to call an API. Um, we're used to accessing uh, Twitter kind of visually, but it does have a computer side. Twitter speaks computer practically as well as it speaks human, and that's what an API is. An API is like a web browser for a computer. It's the way a computer accesses the underlying information that composes the website. Um, uh, and, and in the case of Twitter, the API is as rich or as good as, as complete as, uh, the website in the browser. Um, a huge amount of traffic on Twitter through Twitter is programmatic. Um, so if you've ever been followed by a bot or wanted to create a bot or, follow, or, or, or followed a bot um, or worried about bots, um, uh, those are all things that are authored in precisely, more or less, the code that you're going to run today. Um, uh, you are going to be halfway to writing bots um, after the end of this lesson. Uh, now everything I'm showing you is for reading Twitter, for pulling from Twitter. I'm not going to show you, I'm not showing you in this demo any of the content that pushes to Twitter, pushes out tweets, for example, uh, which is the, uh, the, the, the main half of what a bot does, right? Interacting with the world, not just observing the world. Um, but, you know, we're interested in, in data and accessing data. So uh, in this demo, we're focused on the reading or viewing side of Twitter. Um, in the process, we're going to experience a, a closed API. What does that mean? It means you can't just run the code you know, that I'm giving you uh, uh, and expect it to work. Um, you have to go through a registration process with twitter.com. Um, I've given you instructions for that. And, and, uh, and when you do that, the code you run is gonna be tied to your identity. Um, you're gonna get credentials, you're gonna put them in a file, and, uh, you'll, give, you, and you'll follow the instructions I've given you um, uh, to load that file in so that you can be authenticated. I'll show you all that. Um, if you're worried about privacy, the thing to keep in mind is that because you're registered with Twitter, um, uh, these are actions, these actions you're performing in code, they're, they're, you're performing them on your own account. So I'm not gonna have you do anything you wouldn't do on your own Twitter account. Uh, and all of that sort of history or surveillance or whatever uh, is just akin to what you're already sharing with Twitter merely by having an account and interacting with Twitter through that account. Uh, um, so you're basically logging in through the code on your computer instead of logging in through your browser on your computer. Uh, and those are you know separate ways in, but you're accessing the same data through the same identity. 
One consequence of a closed API, of having to register for access to an API, register for access to Twitter, is they're a little more restricted. They, you, you, your hands can be tied. Um, it's throttled on how many tweets you can access. You can only access so many tweets as a human on a browser, but as a computer, um, you can, in principle, ac you know, download all of Twitter. You, you can't do that um, when, when your access is throttled. You can't do a million requests. Um, very easily through the uh, through the access I'm giving you. In fact, if you try to run this notebook over and over and over in a very short period of time, uh, you may start to get error messages uh, as you reach uh, your limit of to the number of queries. So these restrictions can seem a little arbitrary, um, and certainly they can feel more constrained than an open API that you don't need uh, special keys or credentials or registration for. Um, now, why does this exist? What's going on? Well. Well, Twitter gets abused, uh, especially by bots. Um, Twitter's presence in the news is often how it's abused, right? Uh, fake news, um, Russian propaganda, uh, uh, you know, um, um, other kinds of political propaganda. Uh, those are all, that's all news about bots. That's all about how it's being abused by bots. So uh, these limits requiring you to register, jumping through hoops, having, um, uh, having limits on data you can access. They're all there to protect you, to protect the internet, to protect your peers, to protect the world, to protect democracy um, from abuse by uh, bots. Uh, the limits are there to allow you to explore, allow you to play around, allow you to even build um, interesting, exciting stuff and to run all this code, um, but uh, in a way that, that prevents you from doing damage to, to other people or institutions. Um, so uh, we can get to the code. Uh, after all this intro content, uh, we have boilerplate code. You do not have to understand it. I'm just asking you to run it. I'm gonna hit the play button. Um, and uh, we'll continue all down to authentication. When this opens up right here, I just ran this code and this button appears. I'm gonna, let me repeat that. So clear. So when I run this code, a button's going to appear. Um, I'm going to hit that button, and what I'm going to, what you're going to have done, you're going to have um, started off with a file that looks a lot like this, and everywhere it says "Change me" in Twitter, you're going to um, enter something until you get. Uh, you're going to replace it with these really ugly strings like this. Not these exact strings. These are these are dummies. I've I've added my own uh, credentials. Um, and so when we hit upload, you're going to upload your own uh, authentication file with those long meaningless strings kind of filled in. And those are your keys to Twitter, basically. Those are your keys uh, for accessing your own account through the computer instead of through the browser. Now, once I've done that, this used to say upload zero, now it says upload one. Uh, when it says upload one, I'm gonna, if I run it again, it'll go back to upload zero. Uh, so don't run it again. Um, just click down here and hit play. And then this next code block, uh, it looks complicated. It's actually not so bad. All you have to know is that you run it after loading your thing and it's gonna read everything into API. Um, what's this little, uh, this is gonna be a variable and it's, it's gonna contain your keys. It's gonna contain your um, uh, access to Twitter. From now, uh, from now on, everything below, anytime you go to the internet, access Twitter, um, through Python, you're gonna, uh, all the commands in the rest of this notebook that access that, that access your account, are gonna say API dot something. Um, uh, this is the basis, uh, this variable is the basis of your interaction with Twitter because it contains your keys, your, your credentials. So now having gotten ourselves um, to, act, let's actually interact with Twitter using this information. So um, I wanna start by accessing a user and by displaying its tweets. So here we have Magical Realism Bot. It's a sort of whimsical bot that, that makes up um, magical realist kind of literary scenarios randomly. Um, each of those could be like a little kid's book or something. And after loading up the data, we're going to use a for loop to print out all the tweets one by one. Um, uh, now, often uh, when you interact with uh, tweets, uh, sorry, with lists, uh, 
uh, in, in my class, it's often going to be made of examples by me, uh, but now the thing we're going to iterate through is a bunch of tweets from the internet that just occurred. This just happened now. So when I run this, uh, we have tweets that are happening. It looks like it posts every four hours. Do you see that? A magical realism bot posts every four hours. Uh, uh, I'm running this in, uh, um, in September 2022. And its most recent tweet, by thinking of a candle, an Italian prince is able to summon forth an elf. So that's a magical realist plot. The one before that, an innkeeper in Manchester is famous for eating moonlight. You know, these are, these are whimsical scenarios. And we can see that. Um, let's access magical realism by, and, and see its most recent tweets and see if we can kind of verify this experience. Um, come, I'll just type it. Magical realism. Uh, it's, it's case sensitive. Magical realism. Awkward. It's right here somewhere. There we are. Magic realism bot. Oh, I did magical. Uh, and here we are. Uh, everything I've said. Look, this is what we just pulled. By thinking of a candle, an Italian prince is able to summon forth an elf. An innkeeper in Manchester is famous for eating moonlight. So this is stuff happening on Twitter. We just accessed it through the computer. Everything you see in the code notebook, you can hop on the Twitter and verify that it just happened. Uh, so uh, having done that, um, let me explain the code a little bit. For the most part, this is, this is kind of ugly. Um, what do I want you to know? I want you to know the rocket ship means, you know, these lines went to, onto the internet. Um, cause uh, in other lines that don't have rocket ships didn't go to the internet. They just used data that we pulled from the internet. Um, max results is kind of a suggestion. <laughs> Uh, this is a way of saying, don't give me more than 100. It doesn't say give me 100. Don't ask me why, but they don't always want to give you all the ones you ask for. Um, there's some jargon here that I'm just giving you just to make this work. Uh, and yeah, this, is, this is for an important reason. Um, uh, what I'm doing here, I'm giving you code that works. I'm showing you when, when and where to change it to make it work for you, to make it do interesting stuff for you. I'm not showing you, I'm not asking you to write this from scratch or figure out how to write it from scratch. I'm not asking you to write it for yourself. I'm not asking you to understand, you know, uh, why the, you know, why max results has an underscore, why there's a thing called tweet fields, why its input is in a list. I'm not asking you to know any of that. Um, the, when the, the place I want you to understand what you're looking at is in the code lessons. Uh, the things that I want you to turn off, that why part of your brain, and just run code that does cool stuff, that's the demos. The purpose of these demos is to give you code that works uh, at some expense of understanding so we can complement the lessons, which give you a lot of understanding uh, at the expense of things that do interesting, exciting, cool stuff in front of you. So you're getting both of that uh, uh, in this course. Um, which we're just seeing, we just pulled tweets down. Uh, now let's say I'm interested uh, in learning more about a user and less about the tweets, right? Because we saw that tweets have properties, they're created at a certain date, they um, have a text, they have associated pictures, um, videos. Users also have traits, right? They have a number of followers, they follow a number of people, they, their, their account was created at a certain time. This is all information that we can access when I run this code. So we're gonna access Merriam-Webster, which is the public account of the Merriam-Webster dictionary. And um, we're looking into it because I think it's really funny. Um, uh, we can see that it's got uh, about a million, just over a million users. Uh, it only follows 700 users. We can, of course, verify that. Let me copy that instead of trying to type anything out. Otherwise, I'll type Mary Immel Webster. And what do we have here? Look at that, a million followers. Uh, notice that it, we have to actually hover over to see the exact number is a million eight thousand, which is the precise number. So the web browser changes the data a little bit to make it more apprehensible or accessible to a human, but under the hood, we get the raw numbers and 700 is exactly 700. Moving along, we can, so this gave us the number of followed, the number of following, um, but we can actually print out those user accounts and that's what this code does. 
uh, uh, it is it first prints out just the information we got from the user object, the username, uh, then is following, uh, then um, this number. And again, this is pretty ugly. Um, all you have to know is this works. So the first output uh, when I run this block is going to be this line. Um, this user is following this many people users. Uh, then we're going to access the internet to get the list of friends. Um, I'm just asking for the first hundred out of those um, uh, uh, 700. Um, and then we're going to get uh, the, a bunch of usernames of, of, of accounts uh, that this person follows and that follow this person. These are identical code. The only place they're different is everywhere this says following, this is going to say followers. And otherwise, it's perfectly symmetrical. symmetrical accessing the data of the accounts you follow versus accessing the data of the accounts that follow you. So we'll run this uh, and we'll see um, Merriam-Webster is following 700 users as we established. They include these 100 users uh, and then here's a looks like Starbucks follows follows Merriam-Webster or uh, and then they're following Starbucks and vice versa. Um, uh, these are all accounts that are following Merriam-Webster. Um, the first 100. So uh, now, I mean, the, the most sort of fun way to interact with uh, Twitter is going to be um, searching it, right? Uh, we can search on Twitter for keywords. Um, I'm going to search on Twitter for uh, information about BBC documentaries. Let's see. BBC documentaries. Um, I like BBC documentaries. Uh, not just Attenborough, if you go on YouTube um, into the 60s or 70s, you can find all kinds of great retro documentaries about nature, about all kinds of things. I like this retro stuff. So I'm interested in that. Um, and so on this search, um, we're finding uh, um, uh, this sort of anecdote about uh, Blue Planet, which was filmed for the BBC. Um, uh, we're seeing uh, a bunch of some political tweets saying BBC should be engaged with this. Uh, and so on. Some of these are, you know, directly about BBC. Uh, some of these are um, invoking the idea of a BBC documentary. This is search. This is what we'd expect. If we run, we will see pretty much the same thing. We're going to do uh, um, API dot, right? And then there's a special function, search recent tweets. I dug it up. I found out how it works and I got it working so that you can run it and not have to worry about things. You're going to see a bunch of recent tweets. First, we go to the internet and pull these down. That's what's going on here. Uh, with the rocket ship and then this for loop is looping through those tweets to display them on the screen uh, and when we run that we'll see a bunch of these including let's see do I see hmm. I'm gonna run that search again and see if we see any overlap so I'll run search again and see if anything new pops up yeah, look, the um, uh, this is rotating fairly quickly. Are we getting the same result? No, we're not. Um, I don't know why. Uh, it could be that a lot of these are different kinds of tweets. We should be getting overlap. It, it would just kind of take kind of more careful looking to confirm that the thing we just plugged in on the API side is uh, you know mirroring or analogous to what we plug in uh, to what we find on the web browser side. Um, and of course, I put in uh, I put in a request for uh, the first twenty tweets. I could make that larger. You can actually um, get quite a bit of tweets uh, for each search. Uh, I think it's up to the first thousand these days. Uh, so a lot of data for you to pull down is you know do search for search for strings, search for you know do text analysis on or or, or other methods that you start to learn as you become a more proficient. Programmer, and the the thing to to keep in mind is, you know, every time I run this, I'm going to get different tweets. Twitter is constantly happening, um, uh, and it's big, uh, and so it's great to be able to search it. Uh, a major thing that people use Twitter for, um, and and the major way people find each other on Twitter is through the use of hashtags. Uh, this code down here is identical to the code that was up there. I'm just changing the search query, which is the contents of this string right here. I want to look for hashtag dad jokes and all, and we'll see the same kind of thing. Um, what's a, a frog's favorite meal? Burger and flies. Very, very funny. 
Yeah, and there's a lot of them that can just keep going. Uh, so if you want a more efficient way of collecting bad jokes, Python is actually a, a great for that. Um, uh, we can uh, we can search hashtags. We can search at, which is sort of references to other users. Um, we can uh, retrieve tweets by activity, uh, even by language. Uh, the there is uh, a maximum that you can retrieve with any query, but it's kind of well within uh, what you want to do. Uh, it is possible once you become a graduate student, academic, or, or, a, or a paid researcher, there's even more things you can access. You can start to access geolocation, uh, searching for tweets that are coming from certain coordinates on Earth. Uh, and so the search is quite powerful. You can just really explore the world, explore the world as seen through social media. You have to keep in mind uh, this gives us an opportunity to be curious about the world, to explore uh, Twitter and um, a as a lens into what's going on in the world. So for, for my case, I'm, uh, uh, I've been watching the, um, the Ukraine-Russia war. Uh, and um, I'm interested not just in sort of the day-to-day -day happenings of that conflict, but also the sort of um, cultural analog or cultural roots of that conflict, uh, which you can see play out in some subtle and simple ways that are accessible through Twitter. Um, Kiev is the capital of Ukraine. Um, there's a Ukrainian language, and Kiev has a different spelling in Ukrainian language than it does in Russian language. Uh, right here, you can see the uh, Ukrainian spelling. Right here, you can see the Russian spelling. How do I know that? I do not know either of these languages. I went on a, uh, a Wikipedia, Ukrainian Wikipedia, Russian Wikipedia, and just copied the, the text that I saw uh, for, for, that, for that article. Um, the rest of the string, so this is a keyword that we're going to search Twitter for. And these other things, this is where advanced search comes in. You know, we're not just looking for keywords, we're specializing in the search. We're searching for to, uh, instances of this string that occur in the Ukrainian language, and we'll get a list of those. And then instances of the spelling that occur in the Russian language. And I'm interested how many Russian-speaking people, these are tweets identified by Twitter as being in Russian as opposed to being in Ukrainian, um, how many Russian-speaking people are using the Ukrainian spelling of Kiev? Uh, and, and vice versa, we have down here. How many Ukrainian language uh, tweet tweeters um, are using the Russian spelling of, of, of Kiev? Uh, these are also keywords. What we're saying here is I don't want uh, tweets that are replies to anything. I don't want tweets that are retweets of anything. I kind of want original, let's say, uh, original organic uh, first-time tweets. And I'm going to pull uh, 100 of each. I want... Ukrainian spelling uh, in uh, Ukrainian language, Ukrainian spelling in Russian language, Russian spelling in Russian language, and Russian spelling in Ukrainian language. So when we run that, what's going to happen? What are we going to see as output? Nothing, because we collected, we went to the internet. You can see the rocket ships on the end. Um, we went to the internet, but uh, and then we stored data in, we stored lists in those variables, but we haven't printed those out yet. I'm going to do that here. We're going to see a sample of these tweets from the very first list, um, and then something's going to happen, kind of. I mean, nothing I can understand. Like I said, I, I don't know Russian or Ukrainian. Oh my goodness. Um, uh, but this is a, you know, these are a bunch of tweets that contain the, the, that spelling of Kiev, uh, the Ukrainian spelling. Uh, and these were all identified by Twitter as Ukrainian language tweets. Um, and uh, now what I'm going to do here is uh, so this is this is where we get into some kind of investigation. This is where we are able to explore the world and learn something about it. What I'm going to do is uh, we asked Twitter for up to 100 tweets of each of these four cases. Um, Ukrainian spelling, uh, Ukrainian or Russian spelling of Ukrainian or Russian language. And I want to know the, and then Twitter, you know, you ask it for 100 and it's going to go back. If it finds 100 in the last day, it'll just give you um, tweets from the last day. If it has to go back a week or a month to find 100 uh, tweets, it'll go back a week or a month. And so how far Twitter goes back in order to uh, get you your query gives us a sense kind of of the volume or density of um, that kind of content. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run this and we're going to get the creation date that's this, of the last tweet in every list. So what do we learn? We learn that um, uh, today is the 27th, and um, Twitter only had to go back a couple hours uh, in order to get uh, 100 instances 
of the of the word uh, of the Ukrainian spelling of Kiev in the Ukrainian language. Same with the Russian spelling of Kiev in the Russian language. It, 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 there was enough. It only had to go back to today. But um, in order to get uh, to find Russian spelling of Kiev in Ukrainian language or Ukrainian spelling of Kiev in Russian language, um, it, had, it had to go back a lot farther. And that kind of says there's a lower density, which makes sense. Um, if you're a Russian speaker, you're unlikely to use uh, the Ukrainian spelling and vice versa. So we're able to learn already about the density. We'll call this a sanity check, okay? Uh, now I got curious, well, you know, um, there are instances of Roman characters in um, Cyrillic language texts. For example, the Z that uh, um, is or was used by Russia to, to signify, um, uh, you know, support for, for that conflict. The Z doesn't occur uh, in Cyrillic. Z is a Roman character. Um, and so I was curious about, we also have in English, um, there's a Ukrainian spelling of Kiev. And in Roman characters, there's a Russian spelling of Kiev. Under uh, Soviet Union, Kiev was spelled K-I-E-V, uh, and today it's spelled K-Y-I-V. And so I just did, this is the exact same thing you're looking at before, but with Roman instead of Cyrillic characters. And we're gonna do exactly the same thing. We're gonna collect some tweets. Um, I'm gonna, we'll list some out, even though I still can't, you know, <laughs> still can't read uh, Russian or Ukrainian. Um, and then we're going to do exactly the same thing of printing out the creation dates of the hundredth tweet in each category. Uh, and what do we find? Um, well, uh, we didn't have to go back very far. We went back a, a little farther. I, I don't know if you remember, but it was 927 for the Ukrainian spelling in Ukrainian tweets. So we had to go back a day um, to get Ukrainian and Ukrainian. We had to go back um, the same amount pretty much to get um, the Russian spelling uh, in Russian. Um, just as before, we had to go back about a week um, in order to get the Russian spelling in the Ukrainian uh, uh, language. Uh, but this is something that popped out to me. is kind of interesting. To get the Ukrainian spelling of Kiev uh, in a Russian language tweet, we only had to go back a day. That means there's a, there's a higher density uh, of those tweets. And it didn't work for the Cyrillic Russian spelling of Kiev. But it does work for the Roman Russian spelling of Kiev. The, the, and so um, I'll be leaving. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's like an interesting question. What does that say? What does that teach us about the conflict? Is there anything there? Um, uh, it keeps happening. This isn't just me running this now. I've, I've sort of been checking for a while to see if this is a pattern. And uh, yeah, maybe you have an idea of, of what to make of it. Uh, so uh, once again, like we're surveilling the earth. Uh, as viewed through social media, and we're able to ask questions about um, how people use language, what people's perceptions are. For culturally loaded language, we're able to learn about culture and conflict just through word usage that we can search very superficially uh, using the immense power and volume of Twitter. Um, that doesn't mean we can understand you know, everything that's going on, uh, but again, it is possible when you ask the right question, when you have the right curiosity, when you even have the right maybe domain knowledge, um, to gain insight into what's going on in the world through investigating, playering around with Twitter and code. Uh, put in keywords of your own, start looking around at what's going on in other places, and see if you can learn something about the world by playing with this code. Um, so uh, I'm going to conclude with one more kind of category of interaction with Twitter. And in addition to pulling tweets down by user for, or by keyword, uh, you can. there's also sort of a couch mode of Twitter where you just run some code. You do not have to understand this code. This is quite ugly code. I'm just going to ask you to run it. Um, uh, and then um, we're going to stream Twitter live. Um, so... Uh, what I'm going to ask you to do, this says if false, so um, it's, nothing's going to happen. Um, to make the, I, I kind of do that because this code will literally run forever if you let it. So uh, to run this code, you have to change that to true. Um, and then we're just going to run it. And what we're going to get is um, a printout of tweets as they happen. Um, and Look, look, so we're already just getting a huge amount and Twitter's just streaming like crazy. This is Twitter now. This is Twitter live as it's happening. Um, 
Uh, and you can, ju I mean, I can, I mean, this gives you a sense of how much of Twitter is not in English, right? Um, we're seeing a lot of languages just passing for us. This is, this is really being plugged into the matrix. This is the raw data field in, in, into this world. Um, the star means the code is running. I'm going to hit the stop button to make this stop. Um, I'm even going to change this true back to false. Uh, and then I'm going to go down here. Uh, now, it's a little less useful to have everything, uh, all of Twitter. Maybe you want to narrow it down. So just as before, you can put keywords in. I'm going to search for uh, K-pop or J-pop. So I'll get twi tweets on either. Now, I'm a little behind on my international pop, so I'm not going to totally comprehend everything that uh, goes on here, but maybe you will. You can see it's happening uh, at a slower rate. Um, you can also see it's surprisingly, uh, as this goes on, like we are seeing different languages popping up. So Korean and Japanese pop uh, have worldwide appeal. I'm seeing Spanish tweets. Um, it's really reaching and touching an international audience and we can gain access into this. Imagine, for example, I don't know, um, taking a list of all the languages uh, that are identified by Twitter, tweeting the, the keywords for K-pop or J-pop. Um, uh, that would give you, that would be a way of doing market research to see uh, what, what language, you know, what, what language communities are most interested in uh, these genres of international pop. Um, and you could even, uh, as you get more and more access to the Twitter API, you can do historical searches. You could rerun this search in every year going back to when Twitter was created uh, to, to understand the evolution of that international interest. These are things you can do in code that you just can't do through your browser. And that's kind of the point, right, is that you gain a new insight into um, what social media can tell us about social systems and social science um, uh, when you can access social media through code. Um, so, uh, you've interacted with social media before. Uh, you've always done it through a browser, uh, but when you've done it in your browser, um, uh, you've been secretly interacting with the sort of back end. And uh, by using code, we can access that back end directly and uh, at volumes that are kind of unprecedented. And we can gain a deeper insight uh, into the, the side of Twitter um, that your computer sees. We only did the read side. We only read from Twitter, right? We, we got data from Twitter. We didn't push or write to Twitter. We didn't post any tweets or create any accounts through through. Uh, through kind of bot action, but that's like a whole thing that can be done. Uh, the advantages of, of doing all of this in code, besides just demonstrating how magical code is, how, how it's this parallel uh, um, view into Twitter, uh, and how versatile is, you can ask questions, you can collect data, you can surveil the social media world and interact with it um, uh, in a more systematic way. Uh, and then you interact uh, in a casual way uh, with social media every day. So I hope this is eye-opening and mind-expanding. Um, I hope you play around with it, throw in some other usernames or keywords, and just uh, explore and play around. Um, I hope you find this uh, enlightening and enjoyable, uh, a new view uh, that code offers into the sort of mundane everyday experience. Um, and with that, uh, thank you very much.